Hey everybody, Shadok here, doing a video to basically go over the lore of Guild Wars 1 and kind of relate it to Guild Wars 2 so that all you people who are excited for Guild Wars 2 but never played Guild Wars 1 will know what the hell is going on while playing through the storyline. So first off, this is the first place you will ever see in Guild Wars if you play from beginning to end. This is Ascalon, which will be in Guild Wars 2, although it will be a dungeon in Guild Wars 2. It's a pretty nice looking place. And then the Char, who are a playable race in Guild Wars 2, and did this. This right here is post-searing Ascalon. The Char basically burned the whole entire city to the ground, and this is what they left. Uh, most of the humans died, some survived and stayed, and many decided to go north to Lion's Arch. To do that, they basically went all the way through these mountains right here, doing various things. Fought their way through the mountains. King Adelburn stayed back in Lion's Arch. I mean, uh, excuse me, stayed back in Ascalon. He's the king of Ascalon. And his son, Prince Rurik, died somewhere here in the mountains during one of the missions. So you fight your way all up to Lion's Arch to try to find help from Kreta, which is a nation in Tyria. And Tyria is basically the world of Guild Wars 2. So Lion Ar Lion's Arch is pretty much the main human city, if my understanding is correct, in Guild Wars 2. It was flooded when one of the dragons rose up from the ocean, and then they moved back and rebuilt. It's a pretty nice looking place. And so basically you come here and you find out about something known as the Flame Seeker Prophecy. Um, basically your character is in the prophecy as being the one who will destroy the Mersat, an evil race of magical creatures that are pure magic and they can pretty much do anything they want and every couple of years they sacrifice the Chosen who are humans and you don't know what they do with them, why they sacrifice them until later on. So. Basically, I'm not going to bother going to all the outposts because it's kind of pointless. But you fight your way through here. You're fighting for the Scepter of Or, an extremely powerful scepter, which can supposedly do pretty much anything. It can control the dead is its main thing. So you fight your way through, go through the jungle, um... And you get the Scepter of Or into the hands of this dude named Visor Kilbron, I believe is his name. And then you go to this place right here, the Ring of Fire Islands, and you find out that Visor Kilbron isn't really a good guy. Um, he's actually an undead lich who was the only survivor of some old city where the gods used to live before they left the earth so you go to this place and you find out that he's trying to free the titans which are giant demons that he wants to use to enslave the world pretty much um turns out that the way you fulfill your prophecy is by opening the door of kamali which is actually what the lich's plan was all along he planned to open the door because the titans were inside the door. The titans were the enemies of the Mersat and therefore destroyed them, but at the price of the titans being released. You kill the lich though so that the titans become unorganized and don't follow through with their plan. And that pretty much saves the world. So from then on I'm not going to go into too much detail on the other two campaigns. I'll go into a little bit of detail because they're pretty important, but they're really not going to have much to do with the Guild Wars 2 campaign early on. So first off, there's factions. There's this guy named Shiro Tagachi. He was a bodyguard of the Emperor, and 
he spoke to a fortune teller who turned out to be a demon. The fortune teller told him that the emperor who he was supposed to guard was going to have him killed. So what did he do? He freaked out and killed the emperor first. Well, it turns out that the prophecy was true, but the reason he was going to be killed was because he killed the emperor. He really was an idiot. He just thought, I'm going to survive, I'm going to kill this guy, and it ended up getting him killed. So he comes back as a demon in this campaign. And everywhere he goes, everyone is infected with something known as the plague. Everyone becomes plague-born. People, they're pretty much turning into zombie-type things. And you have to try to unify two groups. The Luxons, who live over on the Jade Sea. It is a sea that was turned to Jade when Shiro was killed. And then the Kurziks, who live in the Amber Forest, a forest that was turned into Amber when he was killed. Um, so you fight... You get these people together and use the plague as a reason to get them together. You Shiro and everyone unites and you kill Shiro. And then these two people go back to fighting. In the time between this in Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2, these two groups right here will be united by the new emperor. And they'll basically become an extremely powerful nation who will be completely closed off from the world. And dragons in the sea will make it impossible for people to access this area when Guild Wars 2 first comes out. I'm sure they'll pop up later on, but in the beginning they really won't have anything to do with the game. So next up we have Nightfall. Basically what happens in Nightfall is a commander of some country is trying to bring an army of demons out for a god named Abaddon who was struck down because he gave magic to humans and the gods did not like this so they struck him down they locked him up and he's trying to come back in this campaign um whereas factions is more themed around like asian culture this is more around maybe ancient egyptian something like that um you can tell from the look of the people and things uh basically you fight the army of demons you're in this little island right here, and then this is the country that you're going to war with. So you fight them, like, right here, and you lose because they summon some demons, and then everyone gets messed up, and you have to flee into the enemy country. You build support with the people, then you head up here to Vabi, and you get the prince's support, all the uh, rich princes, and... Basically, you form an army to fight these demons. You also have to free an undead lord known as Palawa Joko. Palawa Joko apparently attempted to enslave all of Istan, which is the third campaign, which is where Nightfall takes place. He attempted to enslave all of Istan, but you need his help to get across the sulfurous wastes, a wasteland that no living person can get across unless they ride on giant worms that only he knows how to tame. Now, he helps you, he goes back to building his army, and you really don't have time to stop him, you just have to let him go, and you head on into the vortex over here after killing that commander we were talking about. We decide, okay, we gotta go in now and kill the god who is chained up in this realm. So you fight through all these demons, and you basically murder a god, which is a pretty epic end to a campaign, for sure. Even though he does look very strange. It's just a floating head with two hands and he's chained to the ground. and It's kind of weird. You can look it up on Google. His name is Abaddon. A-B-A-D-D-O-N. I just don't feel like playing through the mission right now. And you just fight through this place. And when you kill Abaddon, Cormir, who is the leader of the group you are a part of called the Sun Spears, becomes a new god. Taking his place. And... From there on, this campaign's done. You can head on over to Eye of the North, which is not a campaign. It's an expansion that was added to the game to connect this game to Guild Wars 2, basically. Guild Wars 2 
almost wouldn't have been if it wasn't for this game because basically Eye of the North was an attempt to create Guild Wars 2 and they realized, well, we can't make this an expansion. We can't make this a new campaign. So let's scrap this idea. We'll make Eye of the North and then we'll make Guild Wars 2. They basically wanted to make a new campaign and they just realized they were so limited by this game's engine, they could not do what they wanted to do. And then they went to work on Guild Wars 2. So basically what happens in... Oh, and by the way, in Guild Wars 2, Palawa Joko succeeded in taking over Istan with his army. So that's why you can't enter that area in the beginning. I'm sure they'll have a later expansion where you need to go fight him and take back that country. But him and his undead army did manage to take over, which is why that's important. Now, in Eye of the North, you basically fight the destroyers. They are creatures that belong to the dragon Primordis. Um, the great destroyer is Primordis, the first dragon to awaken. It is uh, his lieutenant. And you need to kill the great destroyer, and by doing that, to do that, you need to unite the dwarves, the Norn, the Azura, and the humans. And you also get some help from some char, which this is the first time you actually find any char that you can actually talk to without them trying to kill you. So that was definitely a really cool thing when you first started playing this campaign. Uh, as well as Norn were introduced here. They did not exist before this, neither did Azura. And, uh, yeah. So you fight back, you kill the Great Destroyer, and then you pretty much postpone the Dragon's Awakening by doing that for, as many of you know, 250 years. In this campaign, you can find... Um... Uh... Two sleeping dragons, two sleeping elder dragons, Prim Primordis and Kralkatoric. Kralkatoric uh, looks like a mountain. Pr uh, people say that it's Kralkatoric. Um, Primordis, you see at the last cutscene in the campaign. It's basically just a statue, it looks like, up against the wall in a cave. And then there is a lieutenant dragon, supposedly, of the dragon Jormag, the ice dragon, frozen under Drakkar Lake. So we believe that lieutenant's name will be Drakkar, but we don't know for sure. Um, we also discover where the Silvari come from. It is, I believe, an Alkazai Tangle or Arbor Bay. It's an Arbor Bay, I believe, right here. This is where the Silvari are. You can see the Silvari tree. It's a small tree, but it's a small white tree with a tablet underneath it, planted by Ventari the Centaur. And... That's where the Silvari come from, right here. This is where the homeland of the Azurans will be in Guild Wars 2. And um, the Norn, I'm not really sure, because all I know is they are forced south. So they were in this area up here. And in Guild by the time Guild Wars 2 comes out, they were forced somewhere down here. Because a dragon forced them down. So yeah, that's uh pretty much... All I can really go over. Um, Ascalon in Guild Wars 2 was finally defeated by the Char. And the king, King Adelburn, used his magical sword to basically incinerate everyone and everything. Turning them into angry ghosts that wanted to defend the land from anyone or anything. So that will be one of the dungeons in Guild Wars 2. That's something pretty important. That event where he did that was known as the Faux Fire. This is all from the novels. This isn't from the actual game. And um, that's pretty much all there is to it. That's the whole campaign of Guild Wars 1 in a nutshell. That's how it's related to Guild Wars 2. So now when you're playing through Guild Wars 2, if you haven't played this game, you'll actually know what the hell's going on. So hopefully you enjoyed this video. Um, if you like what you see, be sure to check out my channel, take a look at my other videos. I will be getting into the beta ASAP as soon as open beta is finally announced with a date. I will sure as hell be um, pre-purchasing the game, so I should be in all the betas. And as soon as there is no NDA, I will be posting videos. So be sure, if you like what you see, to comment, rate, and subscribe. This has been Shadok from Synergistic Gaming. Thank you for watching.